Good morning. My name is Tim Owens. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are going to spend some time together in God's Word. If you are just joining us, we are preaching through the book of Acts. Uh, but before we begin this morning, I just wanted to let you know that the pastors will be out of town this week. Bill and Kit and Becca and I will be in Orlando at the annual Sovereign Grace Pastors Conference. And so next Sunday, Foster Brereton is graciously stepping in to preach for us. That's right. I know that you won't want to miss that. So plan to be here next Sunday. Today, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 21. Last week, Paul arrived in Jerusalem, and he had a meeting with James and the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And this week, Paul is going to get arrested by Roman soldiers, and he will remain in Roman custody for the final seven chapters of the book of Acts, seven whole chapters of this content. And so the author, Luke, he dedicated a full 25% of the book of Acts to this material. He obviously believes that it is very important for us, and I'm eager to meditate, it, meditate on it together with you today. Now, this is a very long text, but I think it will help us to read all of it together, and then we will pray and begin. So let's read together, follow along in your Bible or on the screen. I'm going to be reading starting in Acts chapter 21, verse 27, and reading through chapter 22 and verse 21. So starting in Acts 21 and verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, "'Men of Israel!' This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then, who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed to Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. 
And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Please pray with me. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to read your word and to hear the preaching of your word this morning. And Lord, your word is not idle. It is powerful. It is sent to accomplish something inside each one of us. And we pray that by your grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would, accomplish, you would accomplish your will in each one of us this morning, that you would apply this text to our lives to bear fruit and encourage us in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. One of the distinguishing marks of the Christian faith is love for our enemies. Love for our enemies. Of course, Jesus commands this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 when he says this, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. So you and I this morning are called to love our enemies. When we love our enemies, we are like God the Father who sends rain on both the just and the unjust. When we love our enemies, we are like Jesus Christ who laid down his life and died on the cross so that his enemies could be forgiven and made his friends. So we are indeed called to love our enemies. But what exactly does that look like for us? I suspect that when we say we should love our enemies, most Christians nod and they smile. Yes, we should love our enemies. It sounds very holy and respectable. But when it comes to actually loving enemies, that's quite a different matter. How are we to love our enemies? And I think the Apostle Paul gives us a compelling example of that in our text for today. In Acts chapter 21, Paul is captured by his enemies. He is violently attacked by an angry mob that wants to kill him. That's what we see in verses 30 and 31. But Paul's response to this situation is remarkable, and I think it's instructive for us. Paul wants to share the gospel with his enemies. Where you and I might see an angry mob Paul sees a preaching opportunity, an opportunity to be a witness for Christ. And you see, 
Paul's ultimate goal is obviously not self-preservation. His goal is to exalt Jesus in every situation. As we said last week, Paul is zealous for Christ. He is passionate about glorifying Jesus, whether through his life or, if necessary, through his death. Last week, we saw that Paul's Zeal for Christ led him to love the church, even if it meant humbling himself and sacrificing some of his Christian liberties for the sake of church unity. This week, we will see that Paul's zeal for Christ leads him to respond very differently than you and I might respond when we're confronted with people who want to harm us. This is our main point for today. Zeal for Christ will lead us to love our enemies. Zeal for Christ, love for Christ has certain implications in our lives. It ought to change our priorities. It leads us to respond in certain ways when we face unexpected challenges. And in particular, it should produce in us a genuine compassion and love for our enemies, our adversaries, those who wish us harm. I believe that this text breaks down into three main sections, which I've titled this way. Point number one, pursue peace in verses 27 to 40. Point number two, identify with them using gospel categories in verses 1 through 16. And then finally, point number three, let Jesus be the stumbling block, verses 17 to 21. So let's jump right into point Number one, pursue peace. Our text begins with Paul in the temple, and Paul is completing a Jewish purification ritual. Uh, You might remember this from last week. This was part of James' plan to dispel certain rumors that were circulating about Paul, rumors that he was teaching Jewish Christians that they must give up Jewish cultural practices in order to come to Christ. So James wanted Paul to publicly participate in one of these Jewish rituals to show that the rumors were false and to preserve unity in the church in Jerusalem. Now, it was a good plan. At least, it was a well-intentioned plan. And as we said last week, it may have worked in some measure. It may have served to clarify Paul's theology in the minds of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. It may have served to build up unity between Jewish and Gentile Christians. But even though it was a good plan, even though it was a God-honoring plan, nonetheless, it had some unintended consequences. We read in verse 27 that while Paul is in the temple fulfilling this purification ritual, that some Jews from Asia see Paul there. Now, these are not the believing Jews in Jerusalem. These are not members of the church in Jerusalem. These are unbelieving Jews that probably know Paul from his time ministering in the city of Ephesus. You remember a couple of chapters ago, Paul spent about three years as a missionary in the city of Ephesus, and Ephesus is the capital of the Roman province of Asia. And then in Acts 20, 19, Paul says this. He says he suffered many trials in Ephesus. Well, where did those trials come from, Paul? They were trials that happened to me because of the plots of the Jews, So there were Jews in Asia who had been plotting against Paul, planning against Paul for years. So these people that Paul meets in the temple, they're not simply people who politely disagree with Paul's theological position. These people are adversaries. They want to cause Paul harm. They've been plotting against him for years, and now they see him in the temple, and they think, this is it. This is our golden opportunity to get rid of this guy for good. Now, in verse 28, these Jews get the attention of the crowd in the temple that day by shouting two accusations against Paul. First, they accuse him of teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Now, that is quite a comprehensive accusation. And incidentally, I think it speaks to the effectiveness of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. 
that the Jews can say, he's teaching everyone everywhere. And that's what we saw when we read about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Day in and day out, he was reasoning in the synagogue. He was reasoning on the streets. He was telling everybody who would listen about Jesus. And these Jews are upset about it. This is incidentally very similar to the accusation that was made against Stephen at the end of chapter 6, just before the Jews stoned him to death. And folks, it is only half a truth. A half truth can be very, very dangerous in the wrong hands. You see, Paul, as he's going to say himself in just a moment, he is the last person who would be teaching against the Jewish people or against the law or against the temple. But Paul is teaching, just like Jesus himself taught, that Jesus has fulfilled these things, that Jesus has changed our relationship to the law and changed our relationship to the temple. Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf. And now with the coming of the Holy Spirit, it is God's people who are being built into a temple for the Holy Spirit. It's no longer necessary to travel to Jerusalem to seek God's presence. The curtain into the Holy of Holies has been torn in two, and now every person can enter God's presence through repentance and faith in Jesus. So that is the first accusation, that Paul is against the Jewish people. He's teaching everyone to be against us. Second accusation that these Jews bring against Paul is that he has brought Greeks into the temple. So we need to do some work to understand how the temple is laid out in Paul's day. This is probably the accusation that caused the most outrage in the temple that day because, you see, the temple in the first century was divided into two courts, an inner court for the Jews only and an outer court for the Gentiles. It was called the court of the Gentiles. Now, between the two courts, there was a four and a half foot stone wall with inscriptions written in multiple different languages warning foreigners not to enter. And actually, archaeologists uncovered one of these ancient inscriptions in 1935, and this is what it said. No foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. So it would have been a very serious matter to bring a foreigner into the inner court of the temple. And Paul would never have done that. And Luke actually tells us the Jews from Asia, they didn't see that Paul had done that. They saw Paul with a Gentile elsewhere in the city having coffee with Trophimus at the Starbucks, and they assumed that they brought Trophimus into the temple. Paul hadn't actually done it. So a half-truth and a lie is what sets off the riot at the temple that day. Now, these two accusations, they make an immediate impact on the crowd. Verses 30 and 31 say that all the city was stirred up. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and they tried to kill him. Now, at this point, an unlikely Savior arrives for Paul. The Roman Tribune hears about the riot, and he rushes on to the scene. Verse 32 says that he took soldiers and centurions, plural. Each centurion was in charge of 100 Roman soldiers. So there were at least 200 soldiers involved in quelling this riot. And he arrests Paul, taking him into protective custody and probably saves his life by so doing. But listen, even then... Even with Paul arrested and hundreds of Roman soldiers present, the crowd is still out of control. Luke says that they are so violent that Paul has to be carried up the steps which led from the temple to the nearby fortress. Can you imagine the chaos of this scene? Paul is probably bleeding. He's, he's at least bruised because we know it says when the Romans got there, the, the crowd stopped beating Paul. So Paul's beat up, bleeding, bruised. He's being carried up the steps because the crowd is so violent. The crowd is so violent that 200 Roman soldiers couldn't restore peace. And right at that moment, that's when we get a glimpse into Paul's mindset in the midst of this crisis. In verse 37... Paul begins talking to the Roman Tribune. 
and our English translation is good, but it does not quite capture the contrast that Luke is trying to draw in Greek between the angry, unreasonable outburst of the crowd and Paul's calm conversation with the Roman soldier. When Paul says, may I say something to you? The Greek sentence is unusually polite. Uh, Commentator David Peterson translates it this way. Is it permitted for me to say something to you? So maybe I would translate it this way. Good sir, may I trouble you for a brief word? (laughs) Paul is bleeding. He's being carried away from a mob that tried to kill him. And Luke portrays Paul as being calm, level-headed, and polite in the midst of crisis. Even, Even polite. He almost died. Paul, folks, Paul has not lost sight. This is amazing. This is a work of God's grace. In this moment, Paul has not lost sight of his God-given mission. Verse 39 says that Paul begged a tribune for a chance to speak to the crowd. Now, this is a question I have for us. Where does Paul get this kind of poise Where does he get this calm commitment to glorify Jesus even when the circumstances are against him? And I just want to suggest two things that enable Paul to respond this way. First, Paul took the warnings seriously. So you might remember from two weeks ago in chapters 20 and 21 that Paul has been warned that this was going to happen. The Holy Spirit had warned Paul that imprisonment and affliction awaited him in Jerusalem. And listen, Paul clearly took the warnings seriously. He prepared himself for the trouble that he would face, so he was not caught off guard by the riot. He knew something like this was going to happen. And just as we said two weeks ago, you and I have also been warned that we will face trouble in this world. Sometimes that trouble is going to come from enemies. You know, I I suspect, if you're anything like me, that it's hard to exercise faith in the midst of any kind of trouble, but it's even harder if you believe the trouble comes from an enemy, from someone who is purposefully bringing that trouble into your life, rather than just random circumstantial difficulties that we all face. If it's an enemy, it's even harder to practice faith in Jesus in that moment. But when we face people who stand against us, stand against what we believe, what we teach about Jesus, my question is, will we be caught off guard? Will we be ready to respond not only peacefully, but with the good of our enemies in mind? If so, we must take the scriptural warnings seriously and prepare our minds and hearts accordingly. So that's the first reason that I suggest that Paul was able to respond this way in this situation. And the second thing I want to suggest is that Paul was able to respond this way because of his confidence in the God behind the warnings. So let me explain what I mean by that. Paul served a God who could tell him what was going to happen in Jerusalem before it happened. Think of that. God knew that the riot was coming. So even though James' plan had unintended consequences, even though James and Paul's plan went massively sideways, God intended to use the riot to glorify Jesus. So just like Joseph, centuries before this, could say what man intended for evil, God intended for good, Paul trusted that God had good intentions even in bad circumstances. So he was able to respond not with outrage or with fear or with anger, but with a peaceful commitment to glorify Jesus in the midst of those terrible circumstances. So what about us here this morning? How do you respond when your plans go sideways? Do we trust God's good hand to use every circumstance for our good and for his glory? Because, friends, if we do, then we will respond differently in crisis. God's sovereignty ought to give us peace, and it should make us into peacemakers, 
when enemies attack. When the mob is trying to kill, we don't respond in kind. Christians don't respond in kind, whether the mob is on the street or the mob is on the internet. Christians are called to love their enemies. So that is point number one. Paul is attacked by enemies who want to kill him, but he responds with the peace and poise of a man who trusts in God's sovereignty and who is committed to glorifying Jesus in tough circumstances. And here's the surprising thing. The Roman, the Roman tribune listens to Paul. He agrees to let him speak to the crowd in this insane moment where the crowd is so violent that Paul has to be carried. So he says, sure, Paul, here's, here's the microphone. Let's see how this goes. Now, what do you think Paul says to this angry crowd? And that brings us to point number two. Identify with them using gospel categories. In Paul's address to the crowd, I think he mainly does three things. First, he identifies with the crowd in verses 1 through 5. Second, he shares how Jesus interrupted his life and changed him in verses 6 through 15. And then third, he shares how it was Jesus who led Paul to evangelize the Gentiles in verses 16 through 21. Now, we will deal with that third part of Paul's speech in our final point. But if you look just at verses 1 through 16 of chapter 22, I think what you're going to notice is that Paul is simply sharing his own personal testimony. He's sharing his testimony of how he became a Christian, and he's doing it, I think, in a very instructive way. Paul starts in verses 1 and 2 by addressing the crowd in their own language. This is probably in Aramaic, and he calls them brothers and fathers. Now, this is classic Paul. If you've been tracking with us in our study of the book of Acts, you know that Paul is always starting off by trying to create common ground with his audience so that he can win a hearing for the gospel. But then in verses 3 through 5, Paul takes it a step further. Look with me at verse 3, and let's read it together. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. Being zealous for God as all of you are this day. Folks, there's that word zeal again. The Jews are zealous. They are passionate about protecting their customs, the temple, the law, their way of life. But note what Paul says. Paul doesn't start off with, you're wrong. You're wrong in all your passions. Jesus is going to judge you. No, he starts off by saying, I was just like you. I was so zealous, in fact, that I persecuted Christians to the death. That's what we see in verse 4. He says, you want to check up on me? You can go to the council of elders. They gave me letters of recommendation to the Jews in Damascus so I could go arrest the Christians there too. I was just like you. That's how Paul starts his address to this angry crowd. He says, I get it. I get why you're so passionate right now. And then in verses 6 through 16, Paul recounts how Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and changed his life forever. How he was blinded and how Ananias had to come and restore his sight and explain what Jesus was calling Paul to do. Now, this is one of three times in the book of Acts that we will find Paul's testimony of how he was saved. So we're not going to spend much time here today. But Paul does give us a new detail about what Ananias said, something that Luke didn't include in Paul's conversion story back in chapter 9. In verse 14, Paul tells us that Ananias said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. You see what Paul's doing there? Paul highlights this detail of his conversion because it clearly connects Jesus with the historic Jewish faith. It was the God of our fathers that appointed all of this to happen. Now, let's step back for just a moment and consider how Paul is using his testimony. What is Paul accomplishing by sharing his testimony with this crowd? If you have been in the church for any amount of time, I'm sure that you have been encouraged to share your testimony. 
This is a common method of evangelism. This is a common method of encouraging one another in the faith. But I think Paul here, if we read carefully, helps us to remember why sharing your testimony can be so powerful. In his testimony, Paul is able to do three important things. First, he is able to humbly identify with the crowd. And note, he's not identifying with them on a superficial level. He's not like, oh, you and I both like bocce ball. No, Paul is identifying with their deepest passions, their zeal. He's saying that he was like them on a heart level. The very sinful passions that had led this crowd to attack and almost kill Paul, Paul is able to say, I get it. I was like that. Paul can say with deep personal conviction, there but for the grace of God, go I. And folks, this is not unique to Paul. The gospel requires this kind of humility from each one of us. Each of us on a fundamental level ought to be able to identify with the lost. We once shared the same passions. We were, perhaps, like Paul shared in his speech, educated at the same schools. We, too, would have run after worldly things and resisted Christ and his people if Jesus had not saved us. So whether we find ourselves talking to a neighbor who is politely disagreeing with us or we find ourselves talking with an enemy, a harsh and judgmental opponent of everything that we believe, we should be able to look at them and think, yeah, I get it. That's the track that I was on. If Jesus hadn't interrupted my life and saved me, I would look just like that. The gospel, the gospel ought to purify all of us of self-righteousness. The gospel teaches us that we, too, were enemies once, and so we, of all people, ought to love our enemies. So that's the first thing that Paul accomplishes by sharing his testimony. He's able to humbly identify with the crowd. Second, Paul is able to show how Jesus is the true fulfillment of the crowd's zeal. Paul thinks that he has diagnosed the problem with these zealous Jews. And he tells us about it in Romans chapter 10 and verse 2. He believes that the Jews suffer from misdirected zeal. In Romans 10, he calls it zeal without knowledge. And here, as he shares his own testimony, he not only identifies with the Jews, but he also points to the only one who can satisfy that zeal. And I find this to be a helpful way of looking at the world around us. How much misdirected zeal do you see around you in the world? There's all different kinds of zeal. There's silly, shallow zeal for clothes, zeal for fashion, material possessions, hobbies, sports. There's zeal for important things like money or power. There's zeal for politics. And then there's plain old zeal for self, selfishness, zeal to have things your own way, to be comfortable, to be in control. But how good, it's, it's very easy to spot those things, especially in others, a little bit harder to spot them in ourselves. But here's the question, how good are we at demonstrating and articulating that Jesus is the better option? That Jesus is the true fulfillment of and the rightful focus of all that zeal that we see out there in the world. He is the origin and the apex of all the beauty and justice and pleasure and friendship and love and comfort and security and safety that we deeply desire. Jesus is the only true fulfillment. Paul looks at their zeal and says, I see that. I used to be like that. Let me tell you where that needs to be pointed towards something that can actually fulfill you. And third, Paul's testimony moves the whole conversation into gospel categories. One concern that I have is that in our good desire to relate to our neighbors, we will sometimes face the temptation to water down the gospel. 
to blur what we believe because we don't want to cause friction. We don't want to cause friction with our neighbors. We want them to see that Christianity is a good and unoffensive thing. But when you share your testimony, it protects us from all of that. You see, sharing your testimony is worldview work on a personal level. When you share your testimony, you establish two categories, whether you mean to or not. I was lost, and now I'm found. The whole human race falls into those two categories. These categories, they evaluate all men and women and all human identity and desire in relation to Christ alone. And this protects us, church family. This protects us from unwittingly affirming a sinful position. We can identify with what it is to be lost, but we are not at liberty to approve of it. And it also protects us from something else. It protects us from trying to create a neutral space here in the middle between lost and found. Do you know what I'm talking about? Trying to create a neutral space. It's when we pretend that there's neutral ground where I can just be friends with the world and not think about the spiritual implications. Folks, there's no neutral ground in the war out there. It's either darkness or light. It's either lost or found. It's either worship of the one true king or idolatry. Whatever is not from faith is sin. So just to summarize, Paul calmly pursues his mission to glorify Christ in the midst of a crisis. He identifies with the zeal of the crowd, and he presents Jesus as the one true fulfillment of their zeal. Now, the question is, and the question I wrestled with this week as I prepared for this sermon, is why didn't Paul end his sermon right there? The crowd is silent. They're hanging on every word. Why does Paul mention the Gentile thing again? And that brings us to our final point. Point number three, let Jesus be the stumbling block. In verses 17 to 21, Paul moves on from his conversion story, and he tells the crowd that once he got back to Jerusalem from Damascus, Jesus himself told Paul to leave Jerusalem and go preach to the Gentiles. And Paul even says, Jesus told me to leave because the Jews would not accept my testimony. Who is he talking to right now? He's talking to Jews that he's hoping will accept his testimony. Why did Paul mention this detail in this moment? This is the issue that made the crowd angry to begin with. Hey, this guy brought a Gentile into the inner court. Let's kill him. Why does Paul bring this up? Why not try to win them for Christ and then let's talk about the Gentile thing later? Let's just make that a discipleship issue. We'll get to that in the membership class. (laughs) But folks, Paul doesn't do that. He knows better than that. He knows that he can't call this crowd to repent and believe in Jesus without talking about the elephant in the room. The Jews have become xenophobic. They were meant to be set apart for God in the Old Testament. They were meant to be an example to a watching world to show what holiness and godliness looks like. They were meant to be a blessing to the surrounding world. But they failed. They failed. And now they're just racist. They are against the world. They think that they're better than the surrounding nations. I think John Stott describes the situation very well when he says this. In their eyes, proselytism, that is, making Gentiles into Jews, was fine. But evangelism, making Gentiles into Christians without first making them Jews, was an abomination. It was tantamount to saying that Jews and Gentiles were equal, for they both needed to come to God through Christ, and that on identical terms. The crowd could not have that. Not identical terms with the Gentiles. Do you see, 
the gospel was at stake in their idolatry. In order for them to come to Christ, they had to come humble. They had to lay down their nationalistic, religious pride and admit that they needed Jesus for salvation. But folks, Paul is not trying to pick a fight with this crowd. He's just spent the the rest of his speech building bridges and showing that he understands and appreciates the crowd's zeal. But Paul wants to win these people for Christ, not win them to himself. And he knows that in order to come to Jesus, they are going to have to lay down their idol. And Paul wants them to understand that it was Jesus who led him to the Gentiles. It's the gospel who says everyone comes to the cross on a level playing field. This was God's idea, not just Paul's pet project. Paul is exposing the fact that the real conflict was not between the Jewish crowd and Paul. The real conflict was between the Jewish crowd and Jesus. Paul doesn't pick a fight with the crowd, but he doesn't run away from the fight either. He doesn't hide the real friction between the gospel and his listeners. That is not love for our enemies. Hiding the real friction, hiding the stumbling block of the cross is not how we love our enemies. We love our enemies by sharing the whole gospel including how the gospel intersects with the prevailing idol of the person we're talking to, even if it causes friction, even if it puts us in danger. If we remove the offense of the cross, that's not love for our enemies. That's just self-serving. That's love for ourself. That's hoping that we're not going to get our head chopped off. I'm going to have the worship team come on up. So church family, how do we love our enemies? How do we engage with a culture that is often antagonistic toward what we believe? I think that Paul gives us a compelling example. First, we pursue peace. When the mob seeks to kill, we don't respond in kind. God warned us that there would be trouble, so we should be prepared for it. God is sovereign over the trouble. He has promised to use it for our good and for his glory so we can have peace in our hearts even when our plans go wrong, even in the midst of crisis, even when we're confronted with enemies, people who obviously mean harm toward us. Even in that moment, we can calmly remember our mission to glorify our Savior because we trust that Jesus is Lord even in the crisis. Lord over our enemies. Two, we humbly identify even with our enemies. We must learn to humbly identify with them using gospel categories. The gospel rules out self-righteousness, folks. When someone attacks us, when someone attacks you, deep down you should be able to say, yeah, I get it. That's what I would have been like if Jesus didn't save me. But when we identify with our enemies, we must identify using gospel categories. Lost and found, darkness and light. There's no neutral ground. And finally, we don't remove the offense of the cross. To be saved, you really do have to repent of idolatry. Watering down the gospel or downplaying the moral implications of the gospel. That's not love. That's self-protection. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we are privileged to be able to gather together today to worship the Lord Jesus, to meditate together on your word, Lord. But it is our deep desire that we would not walk out of here unchanged. We desire to be changed by your word, Lord. Would you send your spirit to cause your word to bear fruit in our lives as we go about our lives this week, as we go back to work and back to school, Lord? Would you cause us to engage with greater clarity, a greater focus on Jesus, and a greater desire to exalt him no matter the circumstances? pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.